<laughs> this is what the humanities do. You bring together extremely serious and thoughtful intellectuals and they wrestle with these questions. And you know, a lot of us celebrate Roosevelt and almost hero worship Roosevelt, but he was a very complex human being and he wrote an awful lot and he did a number of things and he grew up and he wrestled with questions of his time, the context of his era, uh, the intellectual currents that were floating through. Uh, but between uh, Thursday night, which seems like about a month ago to me now, and, uh, and this morning, I think we've had just a really, really remarkable set of talks. And I hope that one thing we can do is to transcribe them. Uh, because this was discourse that matters in Roosevelt studies. It's not just the memory coming to a, well, I hope you will agree, it's been a wonderful symposium. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to go straight to your questions here, but let me just start with Dr. West. You've been listening to this. There's one microphone to hand around. Um, one of the things that Patty talked about was the, um, the potency of the word inevitability. So can you just reflect for a moment? Uh, sure. Uh, is this on? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, just to refresh a bit of what happened Thursday night. Okay. Penny, I have email all the time. Uh, there was no planning for this, believe it or not. It's mostly about the, mostly jokes. And <laughs> 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 news. But, uh, but no, I mean, uh, it turns out that this, this has happened uh, all, pretty often before. Uh, it turns out that we were both fascinated, I think, essentially by the same thing. That is, uh, that Roosevelt uh, was a very complicated man. Uh, that especially in his younger years, uh, that he reflected the dominant uh, views of the day, including those on race, including those on uh, the economic nature of the rest, and other people talked about. Uh, and yet, even back then, you can see these seeds of, uh, of complexity. And when you follow this man forward and watch him mature to, a, to this leader, this very revelatory figure in American history, uh, you see uh, that he becomes increasingly complex, increasingly divided, uh, and on issues, uh, on issues like race. Um, and I think the point to take away from that is, this is so, as often as he is portrayed, this sort of cartoonish character. He's very cartoonable. Uh, he's not. Uh, that's, uh, that's very misleading. That's, uh, in terms of inevitability, that's a, uh, I was thinking about having this talking because there's one, uh, this is one way in which he simply did not change his mind. Uh, he was very much caught up in this idea of, of the uh, proper uh, conquest of the West. Now within that, as Patty said, he saw all of these complexities, all of these contradictions. And uh, but on that point, I think he, he held he held that ultimately this was for this was quite good. Uh, and inevitability, I'm not sure, but I think he looked back on it and he saw that it's pretty much that way. Perhaps just imposing his own his own uh, beliefs upon it. This was fully good and therefore it was God's plan. But I think uh, the point that I was saying, you know, listening to Patty was, I think historians today looking back on this uh, would find that part of the most anachronistic uh, because the, the, uh, the one of the important themes in Western, among Western historians today is not an inability of uh, far, something, something far different, and it is contingency. Uh, looking back on this, that uh, there were so many points along the way in which this could have all gone very, very differently. And what you see, I think, in Roosevelt's generation, Theodore Roosevelt was the first president not to have served in the Civil War. He was really the first, uh, first of those national leaders uh, who emerges after this, uh, this very bloody, conflicted uh, history of, of the 19th century. Uh, it's, uh, it's his generation's job, I think, uh, if they see it as their job, to look back on this and to, ex and to, and to impose this, this notion of uh, this was bound to happen. This was, this was part, of, part of the race. Uh, to give a sense, I think, of of unity, of bringing the nation together, turning us into this one, this one great people, confirming that. And I think that's uh, this view of history, that inevitability, the inevitable view of history, I think is important. Just nudge each other when you want to talk. I don't want to uh, make it too formal. I know you're bursting with questions for the whole week, so who would, anyone have to, yes, please speak up. One of, one of the roles that we all admire about TR is in Roosevelt and the conservationists. I wonder how he would view the oil development we're seeing out here now. It's going to be a boom for our area, but it's going to have prices. We'll see all that more on the bus on tomorrow. How would he do that? 
the oil boom that is uh, now uh, consuming Western North Dakota. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to where I thought, oh, that's going around around Williston, and I didn't know it's so close to Williston. It's the so um, riding the bus over to me was just amazing because I haven't read a lot about it. And the flurry is, I think, as Roosevelt and I both feel sad about the flurry of resource that you could use otherwise. Uh, I feel that the key question there, and this is so unknowable as a thing, okay, he was certainly um, enthusiastic for resource production. He was also enthusiastic for, for a degree of preservation. There was some kind of calculation going on in his mind about when there was enough left of the value that he would preserve. And if that was a sufficient amount, you could preserve this number of animals or this number of acreage, and then you could do other things. Which indeed human beings had better have that kind of calculus right on their minds, or we're going to be very cold in the winters and, and starve. So, he was making those calculations very carefully. So what he now, with the current continuation of development after his time, would he say, now we are in a state where we really can we have to be much more strenuous in what we give up, in choosing what we give up and in holding the line. Uh, I, I guess in the bus over, you couldn't help but think of, are we to be disturbed because the landscape that was once so open is now interrupted, if we are to be disturbed, why are we still, most of us, driving fossil fuel cars? And so I, I think, I would hope, well, I think he would, okay, what I, look, I think that his calculation of how much we had lost and how much we still could hold on to if we moved on, I think that would have shifted over time, and he might, or he might for national security reasons say, could we keep this to a time when it's, when it's more, uh, might be more necessary? But my hope is that since he said things so forcefully, and he didn't do focus groups, and he didn't wait to see if it was going to hold well enough, that he would ask us to do what I just proposed, mentioned that we're not doing, look at our own habits in relationship to what is happening in the landscapes, to look in the mirror and to say, this is our consumption. We have to pay attention to the sites of production. We cannot go around in that disconnected way. I would hope that he would be the person who would say that, which no other figure dares to say to us that it's really about us and our consumption. Well, go ahead. I'm struck when I think about Roosevelt and Roosevelt's generation and his attitudes about likening the hunters and trappers to, to uh, Indians. <coughs> Other failure of, this, of that generation and, and many successive generations to understand the different ways in which Native American tribes from the assumptions of the that, that European settlers were with them. Um, it, the, to, the, to the European settlers, as they emerged successfully over the continent, the, um, and the Supreme Court of the United States ratifies this in the early 19th century, um, in Johnson versus McIntosh, that, um, that, the, that the Indians, the tribes, don't know Nobody's picking this up. Oh, yeah. Um, that the tribes don't own land. They, they don't own land because they don't enclose it. They don't cultivate it in the European land. Uh, now, the tribal, one of the, one of the great contributions to Western history that's occurred since my, the first edition of my book uh, is the work by anthropologists and ethnologists that has laid in it. Patty's work uh, draws on this, Elliot's recent work draws on it. Uh, the ways in which these are non-literate, remember, in the, in the conventional sense, they don't, they don't have written languages. And so it's taken anthropologists and ethnologists to unearth these conceptions. But when they are revealed, they end up being utterly incompatible with those of 18th and 19th century Western Europeans. So the settlers assumed wrongly uh, that the native tribes have no particular interest in owning the land because they don't they don't cultivate, of course a lot do, a lot farm, uh, that they move around, but the actual the tribes have affinity for, for certain spots. So 
the, the whole conception of the inevitable march of civilization uh, is driven. I mean, Daniel Boone is, is, doesn't own Kentucky because he doesn't cultivate the land that he lives on. It's driven by these irreconcilable <coughs> conceptions. Uh, and consequently, what we have established, and by the time Roosevelt is president, is we have the Western European views of land usage. Uh, and the Western European views of land usage when unregulated are essentially extract as many resources as you can from the land for your own personal profit. Uh, and Roosevelt ends up retrospectively becoming one of the first people to see, well, wait a minute, uh, if that happens, some of, the, some of these, uh, some of this natural wilderness is go away. But uh, I'm brought back to the fact that the first reason he thinks about conserving these large um, areas is to so his son can continue the hunting expedition. <laughs> Simon, uh, Simon I, I turned off my mic because it's causing feedback, but Simon, you have an advantage over the three people to your right because you spent uh, a significant portion of time in Western North Dakota last year. Talk a little bit about what you're seeing as the magnitude of the, of the oil boom increases. One of the themes that's pretty clearly come through, and Professor Limerick mentioned it as well in CR's presidential address of 1912, is that he's a moralist. He sees the world through a moral lens. And I can't help but wonder that one of the calculuses, to use your word, one of the, one of the ways that he would perceive how we are using our resources would be in a moral sense, and that is, where can we say, well, we don't need this development because it's not morally acceptable. What other sorts of development should we be looking at? And, and what struck us in the, the five months that we were here is how rapidly this area is changing. It really is an industrial landscape. And it was, it was as Professor West made clear on Thursday, it was an industrial landscape already. The railroad came through, the massive grades um, privately held, often by Eastern capitalists. Ranches of the day were obviously industrializing the production of beef and of wheat and of other um, grains. But in the short time that we were here, we saw those, um, those wonderful pump jacks popping up all over the place. And there are piles and piles of the detritus of industrialization. There are, there are pipes everywhere. In, in, um, in March, the road that goes north of Dickinson to Kildare, just a few miles north of Kildare, collapsed. Highway 22 had to be closed, and it caused a diversion of what was it, about 80 miles. People had to divert in order to get to where they wanted to go north of Kildare. So there's a tremendous impact on the infrastructure, on the people. There are lots of people in Dickinson who don't like what's going on. And, of course, on the environment. And, and, and what we sense was that this is a landscape in, in a tremendous transition. And I like the fact that we're questioning the word inevitability because there's nothing inevitable about it. It's a human construction. It tried to happen 15 odd years ago. The price of oil tanked and it was stopped. So, I mean, it doesn't, it, there's nothing inevitable about this sort of thing that's happening around here. And the use of the word inevitability with, with um, uh, apologies to TR, the use of the word inevitability is a kind of a lazy historian's byproduct for I don't really know and so <laughs> I either don't have the um, resources, the, 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 the documents, and so I'm just going to say it was inevitable. Um, there's nothing inevitable about it, but it certainly is happening, and it's happening on a massive scale.
I'm wondering about if he wasn't, and having seen what he saw in the East, and then he comes in the West, and as you said, there was industrialization, and so would it perhaps, you know, is it possible that without totally um, being aware of his conclusion that he might have thought that some industrialization, that the westward movement was in that sense inevitable because man would be for man simply. And that perhaps that was an element of what drove him to be, to think of conservation and, you know, preserving what pockets of wilderness that could be preserved. I mean, making the calculus that you're speaking of. I mean, I, I, to me, it just doesn't, I'm not quite sure that it strikes to me, to me that he would just be unaware of all of that. And that maybe he was young to take kind of the action he did later, but that, after that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's certain, I think, my impression is that's certain. Oh, restatement. Uh, the, uh, the question is on this question of inevitability. Uh, did, the, did the young uh, TR, as he, as, he, as he grew older and matured and went back east, uh, did he develop a sense of we need to, uh, does conservation come in part in the sense that we need to save the West from the kinds of industrializing forces that we see in the east? Because, uh, because I have very fond, you know, deep, uh, loving memories of what I saw as a young man. <coughs> Sir, of course, uh, I think that's absolutely uh, part of it. One of the uh, striking passages in, in Ranch Life is when he, uh, at the end of one of the opening chapters, when he said, uh, I don't think I quoted from it, uh, when he said that uh, this is a way of life that is passing, and it's, it's bad for and there's nothing that's going to stop it. We're going to look back, look back on it nostalgically. But there's no sense of, of, of we need to be careful and preserve some of this. That comes later. That comes later. And I think. Uh, it, Exactly the points you made are, are, are the ones that uh, that moved in uh, that moved in that direction. And to uh, uh, think it builds upon Patty's point, uh, the conservation the conservation efforts in part a sense of sort of inventory of what we had, figuring out what we need to say, what we need to say to protect the water, be ourselves, be in our home. But this other much more moralist uh, moral moralism uh, comes into it as well. This is worth saving simply because this is worth saving. And I can't think, to get back to this point, I can't think of more, uh, something, anything I'm more sure of that Roosevelt, in, in this sense, in this moral sense, you know, if, he could, if he could somehow look back on this, his beloved bad times, and seeing this happen, sure, that would kick in. He says, holy cow, <laughs> this is, we've got a really serious thing. I, I was expecting uh, Patty's point to be to find more evidence of oncoming concentrationism and winning in the West. I thought laments over the burdening of the trees and the Kentucky forests or something, but that doesn't seem to be there. Or maybe I'm, I don't know, it seemed, whatever I thought I was going to see of, oh, here comes Theodore Roosevelt, who will do the national forests, and so, I, and so I'm, I'm happy to know that you think it wasn't, the reason I couldn't find it was that it just wasn't in his mind yet. Um, you can see the Theodore Roosevelt will be a conservationist in the enthusiasm with which he talks about honey. He's very interested in honey, and it's not the voice of somebody who would be happy if that took any further. I will also say the other thing that's really uh, interesting about him as a person that Winnie the West has very elaborate, kind of fashionista descriptions of, of Indian clothing and backwoodsman clothing, and you can kind of see that the whole match with him and his, his tunic, his hunting tunic and so on, that he's really quite conscious about clothing, but it doesn't have to do with conservation. It's just So the honey thing is, is there. Um, I think that what compromises the experiment here is that he's, he got to 1807, and so he was never riding when he in the West very much at all. I mean, it's really um, Lewis and Clark and, and out. So a lot of the stuff where we would, might be able to see what his experience in the West, how it was you know, there's a lot of notes in Winnie the West where he refers to his own experience here to illustrate something about backwoodsmen and their character and so on. But because we don't have those volumes, you, I, I was, even though I did not want there to be 10 volumes, I really yearned for the part on California and the gold rush. I really wanted to know, and that, that ties both questions together, 
what would he make of the California Gold Rush because it was so not the agrarian advance that it was really such a short-term extraction thing. And so would we see some changes there? But uh, it's just very frustrating, isn't it? I mean, look, <laughs> go through those papers that happen. Find that, find that bug. Find the stuff by the gold. There must be somewhere in this paper. Well, isn't it possible that he actually gave us the template for what North Dakota needs to be thinking? Because if I understand it, professional historians, but he wanted to take some parts of the West that were so extraordinary, sublime, magnificent, unusual, unique, and draw boundaries around them and say, we're going to preserve these write-offs in the economy we're at. We're just going to say, these are no industrial zones for human economic activity, national parks, certain national markets. Then we're going to take the rest of the public lands and we're going to have wise use policies to sustain yield. To limit human economic activity by way of regulation, but we're not going to prevent it. We're just going to try to create a scientifically sustainable path for it. And then everything else, have at it, because that's the American system. Didn't he teach us that if we get Western North Dakota in this large energy crescent, we should decide those parts of it that are so magnificent that we want to make sure they don't get damaged. And then we have a minor number of acres in TR's mind. And then for the larger, the Missouri National Grass Valley, one million acres, make it a light footprint to the bottom. The lightest possible footprint that still allows wise use. And then for the larger area, and I hate to say it, but stand for you, Ambrose and Wild Roads and so on, that sort of have had its own, still with human regulation, but not with the same sense of aesthetic or landscape sensitivity. Didn't he give us just that template? Uh. I think that is very accurate. Uh, I, for seven years straight, I've attended the Colorado Oil and Gas Association Rocky Mountain Strategy Conference every summer. So I hang out a lot uh, for natural gas and oil and gas. But I understand their vexation that any time they have a site they would like to develop, an environmental group will call that a special place that they particularly treasure. <laughs> and there is not one unloved square inch. <laughs> who would say, well, okay, if you said, here are the places so special that they really must be reserved, they would say, well, all right then. But since it's so mobile as a concept, the moment that the, the size of evidence is good, it becomes a place where someone had a spirit quest, it becomes a place where somebody can't bear to um, see a site compromised where their toddlers were ran to the ground. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to find any of those have at it zones, and yet everybody is still driving fossil fuel vehicles, and the notion that an electrical vehicle will get you out of the energy business, well, where is the electricity coming from? Then we're back to the coal fields, so that's not going to get us any happier unless. But even wind, you need a rare earth mine, you need steel <coughs> produces. So there's, there's nothing there that consumers, uh, are going to get what they want of the, oh, now we have an energy source with no damage at all. And I, I think that's where Jim Roosevelt's just the rightness would be very useful. Um, at, at the risk of taking all the fun out of uh, this conference, I, I have a fundamental difficulty with investing historical figures uh, as guides for the president. I, I think they make their remarks in a different consciousness. Uh, one of the things that Clay is, is a, a is an expert on Jefferson, among other things, and he was making a reference to him yesterday, and it made me think about people asking me from time to time, because I have to be at the University of Virginia, what would Mr. Jefferson think about these things? And my first impulse is to say, well, he wouldn't think about any at all because he's dead. <laughs> and, 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 and I I have problems with the direct translation of historical figures' attitudes to present controversies. I mean, to the extent that Roosevelt thought about conservation, he thought about conservation in the first two decades of the 20th century. We have an utterly different economic world. We have a different landscape. Uh, and, and things don't translate to me very well. So it may be a fun exercise to speculate on, if we had time travel, what would Theodore Roosevelt 
be doing at this point. They introduced to him the possibility of an oil boom in North Dakota. Um, but, but he's a policymaker from a different world. And I think it's better to understand these figures as historically cabined in, in their thought. Um, I think there's nothing more preposterous than saying Theodore Roosevelt would be leading a petition campaign against the well, that is so ridiculous. The fact is, Mr. Jefferson lives with us, Mr. Roosevelt lives with us because they created institutions that we're still dealing with. So their, their impact is with us in this world, plus they are our elders. And if we live, as many people in this country have lived, in amnesia, uh, when an when a individual is stricken with amnesia and cannot remember anything from the past, we rush that person to an emergency room. When a society does that, we say, on to the next fan, on to the next trend. So, I mean, the story is to do us too. So, I think there is only the greatest respect in turning to our elders, dead or alive, and saying, What did you say that might be of value to us at this moment? Not pretending that they are free to come out and attend a rally with us or anything like that, but I just think, especially people of such enormous influence in shaping our world, either go to the emergency room and get treated for amnesia or pay close attention to them and consider how it might have very in helping us navigate. It's very different from pretending that, that you have their endorsement for the Obama re-election or something. I mean, that's just, that is not a Let me just say at this point that we are on the precipice here of a very significant long debate. <laughs> the future. They may think they can see the future, but they can't, because 
things change. It's like appointing someone to the Supreme Court of the United States on a set of issues that are consistent with the time of his or her nomination, and then for most of the career, you can deal with utterly different issues. And so people say, well, gee, the president was disappointed in this nomination. Um, well, it's just a different world. So I, I just, I think it's fine for people to invest. When Professor Lundgren said earlier, the operative phrase for me was, it's we can use them as we choose to use them. What we make of them, it, sure, they can be inspirations to us. But in the end, it's about us. We're contemporary policy. Let me make a little program note here. We have five minutes. <laughs> and Sharon, I just went to Sharon and begged for a little slack, and she said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to all of you. I know that you're not going to have time, and I know you two want to keep debating this. No, I just want to say that I think it's got to be the cowboy, because love of the cowboy and the ranching industry that was, that's got to have been a big factor. I can't turn that into a park. Very quick. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a quick comment on the uh, Winnie of the West, and I'd like a response from Professor Lindner. I was extremely surprised when I read the Winnie of the West to see how heavily footnoted it was. Yeah. The number of citations, the extensive bibliography, including private papers and pl private libraries, and how often Theodore Roosevelt found inaccuracies, or what he deemed to be inaccuracies. So that when you read that segment about Indian savagery, for me, rather than finding it high rhetoric, I thought that each and every one of those instances was probably included because he had factually read and determined that that was accurate. And elsewhere throughout that volume, he hesitates to write any more because he says it would be too graphic or too disturbing. So is it high rhetoric because we look at it with our modern sensibilities? I felt it was, and I really didn't make that point clear. So, now I felt it was high rhetoric because the language evolves into this happened all the time to everyone. That it's not just this happened in a number of places, which would be the, and I, I agree with more on the um, impressiveness of the research. At first, you think he didn't really have any time to go to all those archives, but then you think, oh, it's Theodore Roosevelt. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. My trouble with that passage is that it is one he creates it's rhetorically not great because he creates one person and then all the targets of the dam occur to that one person who has been presented as a typical frontiersman. So this one person has his infant child bashed to death, his sister has to wear a necklace, so it's sort of a oh dear me, that's really piling it on there. And, but I don't think there's any question those incidents happen. Scale and Typicality, that's the Harvard story question, and he just throws out one wind in that paragraph. So, but I want to think. Very quickly, yes. Yeah. Now, regarding the usability of resources and TR and the um, I sometimes wonder if we create dilemmas where he didn't have a dilemma on that regarding the, his righteousness and constant preaching and doing the right thing. I want to know your thoughts on um, considering that he was constantly, as a politician, balancing so many things and also trying to do the right thing for the greater number of people. And so rather than just looking at a particular people group or uh, profession, whatever it is, he's always looking at the greater good and trying to balance that. What are your thoughts on this? I guess I'm not going to say he was very, very he was a politician. <laughs> 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 so he was doing what he was doing for all of us. And then you get back to very briefly on this point of why we're <coughs> the families were sexy, politically. Uh, it was him, uh, Yellowstone, uh, those were the places that people considered the great, great gyms of the day. I think Penny wrote one. Oh, the grasslands of the great John Hughes. The grasslands, to, to a catch point, you know, it's, it's our later understanding of the works of the even greater uh, appreciation of the beauty of the grasslands that, that uh, explain why it's now being a uh, concern. Politically, this was not uh, a viable issue. Well, Elliot, I, you, know, you know how deep my respect for you is, but when you say the Badlands weren't sexy, maybe we have a low standard of sex here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but this is our Teton National Park.
both a historian and looking back to the past, you see literature is generally talking about, you know, uh, Caesar's 10th Legion and the, uh, you know, the public history of the public Asian was remarkable, you know. To what extent do you think do you place in the, in the past, present, and future? In other words, psychologically, was he a future people? T.I. talks about, you know, we must do this for future generations, but where was he? Past, present, future. How much was he really, truly a future? Okay, I'm going to go to Patty briefly and then to Simon to get the last word. Okay. Uh, I feel that it all comes together, your question all comes together in that he was a very unusual human being for having, in an uh, era of rapid change, a long, deep sense of time. And if you take the distance past seriously, and I will tell you the thing I am proudest of at Sandy American West now that I think Theodore Roosevelt would like most is we're doing a project on Herodotus and how you need Herodotus to understand the American West. He would be our keynote speaker, don't worry about it. Um, so, but I think if you flip your sense of time backward as much as he did and take those people of the ancient world so much to heart, you then have a the capacity for flipping your sense of time to the future, and so you could be thinking of the long haul there. So I think those things are very harmonic, that the uh, stretching beyond today and the day after tomorrow and beyond yesterday, I think that's where he is truly at. Sad to say it, but he seems like an inspiration to us on that. Uh, just to program it up, uh, Simon's going to say something. <laughs> yeah. I so apologize that we don't have a lot more time. Um, that's the nature of this sort of thing. We want to take a little break and spend the afternoon in this discussion and debate, keeping it if we can on Roosevelt. But don't leave when they stop because Sharon's going to come up. We're going to introduce our folks from Chicago. There will be presentations about the next um, TRA symposium. And then she'll give you your marching orders, and you really shouldn't march without Sharon giving those orders. So here's something. <laughs> Well, I'm actually going to take us back to Elliot's talk anyway to remind us on Thursday night that he spoke about how TR was able to be um, friendly to both the eugenicists as well as the author of The Melting Pot. And I think we have to remember that there's that kind of attitudinarianism in TR's ability to understand arguments, many facets of arguments. And that certainly is something that we could remember ourselves and hope that our political leaders at some point in the near future will come to realize is important. Let's thank our panel.